Welcome everyone to the latest monthly EFF Austin meetup. Apologies for technical difficulties. Uh, we've beamed in remote speakers plenty of times, and of course, with one of our most illustrious speakers ever, it chooses to fail on us. But well, thanks uh, for the volunteer and their laptop. We are going to be able to go here. So um, yes, my name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. Um, I see old and new faces. Welcome all. For those of you who are like, what is EFF Austin? We are an Austin-based digital sub-liberties organization. Um, we work closely with Electronic Frontier Foundation out of San Francisco. They are the nation's oldest and largest digital liberties advocacy organization. You can kind of think of them as the ACLU for the internet. They work to protect your rights in emerging technological spaces, especially your First and Fourth Amendment rights to free speech and against unreasonable certain seizure, i.e. Right. They work to protect things like net neutrality, in data encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, and just all sorts of good, wonky legal stuff to keep your rights uh, safe. Uh, they're very cool people. You should volunteer and donate to their cause if you're so inclined. Um, you're also welcome, uh, if you're Austin-based, to uh, get involved with us. We're mainly, um, compared to them, we're much smaller in scope, though we've been around almost as long as they have, almost 30-ish uh, years here. Um, we are the oldest member of what EFF calls the EFA, or the Electronic Frontier Alliance. It is a group of about 100 digital celebrities groups all around the United States. Um, we are the old, uh, oldest member and also the only one in Texas that I'm currently aware of. So we cover a lot of ground. We compare to national EFF, who mainly works on legislative advocacy. We primarily um, engage in education, mainly in the form of these monthly meetups, which are currently the second Tuesday every month here, uh, thanks to our general sponsor, Capital Factory. Um, we do also do some political engagement. We have advised with Austin City Council and the Texas Legislature on various issues. We were involved in extensive discussions around automated license plate readers here in Austin recently, with our biggest win being we got data retention lowered from 30 days to seven days, which we were very uh, pleased to win, though it's still not as much as we wanted. Um, but anyway, so yeah, if you care about these issues, we encourage you to come to me as we encourage you to get involved. We're all a volunteer-run organization at board. We're always looking for to get involved. Um, and yeah, we, we've even been known to occasionally throw cool cyberpunk parties during South by when I convince somebody to give us money for it. So if you know people, introduce them. Um, anywho, without uh, much further ado, we are very honored to have, uh, in many ways, one of the uh, most famous speakers we've ever had come and speak to us. We are very honored that he is donating his time to come and talk to us. Our speaker this month is uh, Bruce Schneier, and I imagine quite a few people in this room already know who he is, but for those who don't, Bruce is an internationally renowned security technologist called a security guru by the economist. He is the New York Times bestselling author of 14 books, including hundreds of articles, essays, and academic papers. His influential newsletter, Cryptogram, and blog, Schneider and Security, are read by over 250,000 people. Um, um, Schneider is also a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet Society at Harvard University, a lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, a board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and Access Now, and an advisory board member of Epic and VerifiedVoting.org. He is also the chief security architect at Inrupt. Uh, and um, Bruce decided to come here to talk to us specifically about some of the interesting parallels between computer systems and their security and political systems and their security. So he's basically going to give us a little talk about how the lessons of cybersecurity can maybe be applied to secure democratic systems from people who might want to hack them. So without further, uh, hopefully, delays, uh, take it away, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for bearing with all the tech delays. Sorry, I can't be there. I, I used to travel a lot more pre-pandemic and I'm just traveling less. So Zoom works and uh, it's a way I can uh, speak at events where I, I can't be there. So this is a talk that I first gave at the RSA conference. And it, it it's my thinking has been a bit evolving since then. And it's really about democracy. And what we as computer security people can can bring to the discussion about how democracy should work. Uh, now, let's it, you'll sort of see how it unfolds. So, really, I mean, there's a lot written about technologies threats to democracy. Right? Polarization has been written about for a couple of decades. Artificial intelligence. I can't go a few days without reading an article about this. Uh, the concentration of wealth and power, certainly. I have a, a, a more general story. 
basically that the political and economic systems of governance that were created in the mid 18th century are actually poorly suited for the 21st century. Right? They don't align incentives well, and they're being hacked too effectively. At the same time, the cost of these hack systems have never been greater across all of human history. Basically, we have become too powerful as a species, and our systems of governance can't keep up with fast-changing disruptive technologies. I, I argue that we actually need to create a new systems of governance that align incentives and that are resilient against hacking at every scale, right, from the individual all the way up to the whole of the planet. So for this talk, I actually need you to drop your 20th century either or thinking. So I'm not talking about capitalism versus communism. I'm not talking about democracy versus autocracy. Actually, I'm not even talking about human versus AI. I'm really talking about something new, something we don't have a name for yet. And this is very much blue sky thinking. It's not even remotely considering what's feasible today. It's also important. So throughout the talk, I want you to think of both democracy and capitalism as information systems, as socio-technical information systems, as protocols for making group decisions, ones where different players have different incentives. And these systems are vulnerable to hacking and need to be secured against those hacks. But that's my framework. And what that means is that we as security technologists have a lot of expertise in both secure system design and in hacking. And I think that's why we have something to add to this discussion that can't be found anywhere else. And again, finally, this is a work in progress, right? I mean, I de debuted this talk at the RSA conference, been working on it since. It might be a book. I'm really trying to create a framework for viewing governance. So this is more of a foundation to discussion than a roadmap or a solution. I have no answers yet. And really, I think by writing. So you're hearing the current draft of my writing, which is the current draft of my thinking. So everything is subject to change without notice. And by the time this is a book in two, three years, it might be widely different. All right, so let's go. All right, so we all know about misinformation and how it affects democracy. Right. And how propagandists have used it to advance their agendas. We're seeing it this week with uh, the war in Israel. Uh, now, this is actually an ancient problem, but it's amplified by information technologies, right? By social media platforms that prioritize engagement, by filter bubble segmentation, by technologies for honing persuasive messages or, or creating deep fakes. But the problem ultimately stems from the way democracies use information to make policy decisions, right? So democracy is an information system that leverages collective intelligence to solve political problems, right? And then to collect feedback on how well those solutions are working. Now, this is different from our autocracies that don't leverage collective intelligence for political decision making or have any reliable mechanisms of collecting feedback from their populations. But democracy, the systems, work really well, but have no guardrails when fringe ideas become weaponized, right? That's what misinformation targets. So the historical solution for this was supposed to be representation. And this is what's failing in the United States, partly because of gerrymandering and safe seats and the two-party system, and money in politics and how primaries work. But the problem is actually more general. Now, James Madison wrote, wrote about this in 1787. And uh, this is Federalist 10. And he makes two points. The first is that representatives serve to filter popular opinions, and that limits extremism. And two, that geographical dispersal makes it hard for those with extreme views to participate. Right? It's hard to organize. Now, to be fair, these limitations are both good and bad, but in any case, current technology, primarily social media, breaks them both. So this is a question. What does representation look like in a world without either filtering or geographical dispersal? Now, does it look like the current you know, Congress today? 
the Republican Party, the, the, the extremists there? Or more generally, how do we avoid polluting 21st century democracy with prejudice, misinformation, and bias? Right, Because these are things that impair both the problem solving and the feedback mechanisms. Right? So that's the real issue. It's not about misinformation. It's about the incentive structure that makes in misinformation a viable political strategy. So this is my problem number one, that our systems have misaligned incentives. What's best for the small group often doesn't match what's best for the whole. And this is true across all sorts of individuals and group sizes. Now, historically, we've used misalignment to our advantage, right? Our current systems of governance leverage conflict to make decisions. The basic idea is that coordination is inefficient and expensive, and individual self-interest leads to local optimizations, and that results in optimal group decisions and global optimization. But honestly, this is also inefficient and expensive. In 2020, the U.S. spent $14.5 billion on presidential, Senate, and congressional elections. You know, and, and I don't know how to calculate the cost and attention. I mean, that sounds like a lot of money, but step back and think about how the system works. The economic value of winning those elections are so great because that's how you impose your own incentive structure on the whole. Now, more generally, the cost of our market economy is enormous. $780 billion spent worldwide annually on advertising. And more billions are wasted on ventures that fail. And, and, you know, and that's just a fraction of the total resources lost in any competitive market environment. And there are other collateral damages. And they're spread non-uniformly across people. So we've ex- traditionally... We've accepted these costs of capitalism and of democracy because the inefficiency of central planning was considered to be worse. But that might not be true anymore. The costs of conflict have increased, yes, but the costs of coordination have decreased. The large multinational corporations demonstrate that large centrally planned economic units can compete in today's society. Think of Walmart. Think of Amazon. Right. If you compare GDP to market cap, Apple is the eighth largest country on the planet. Microsoft is the 10th. Another effect, I think this is also important, of these conflict-based systems is that they foster a scarcity mindset. And we have taken this to an extreme. We now think in terms of zero-sum politics, right? My party wins, your party loses, and winning next time is more important than governing this time. We think in terms of zero-sum economics, right? My product success depends on my competitor's failures. We think zero-sum internationally with arms races and trade wars. And finally, conflict as a problem-solving tool might not give us good enough answers anymore. The underlying assumption is that if everyone pursues their own self-interest, the result will approach everyone's best interest. But that only works for simple problems. And actually, my guess is it requires systemic oppression for it to work. But we have a lot of problems, complex, wicked, global problems that don't work that way. We have interacting groups of problems that don't work that way. We have problems that require more efficient ways of finding optimal solutions than conflict. And and note that we have multiple effects of conflict-based systems. We have bad actors deliberately breaking the rules, and we have selfish actors taking advantage of insufficient rules. So this second is my problem number two, and this is what I refer to as hacking in my latest book. Uh, It was mentioned in the intro, A Hacker's Mind. Uh, So basically, democracy is a socio-technical system, and all socio-technical systems can be hacked. And by this, I mean that the rules are either incomplete or inconsistent or outdated. Right? They have loopholes, and those loopholes can be used to subvert the rules. Right? So examples are Peter Thiel subverting the Roth IRA to avoid paying taxes on $5 billion in income. Right? Or the double Dutch Irish sandwich that Apple and Google have used to avoid paying billions in taxes. Right? This is gerrymandering, the filibuster, must-pass legislation, or tax loopholes, financial loopholes, regulatory loopholes. 
And basically, I argue in my book that in today's society, the rich and powerful are just too good at hacking. And it's becoming increasingly impossible to patch our hack systems because the rich use their power to ensure that the vulnerabilities don't get patched. Now, this is bad for society, but it's basically the optimal strategy in our competitive governance systems, right? The zero-sum nature makes hacking an effective, albeit parasitic, strategy. Right? Hacking isn't a new problem, but today's hacking scales better. And it's overwhelming the security systems that we have in place to keep hacking in check. Think about gun regulations or climate change or opioids. And complex systems make this all worse. Right? Our systems are nonlinear, tightly coupled, unrepeatable, path-dependent, adaptive, co-evolving, right? super complex. All right, so now add into this mix the risks that arrive from new and dangerous technologies, like the internet or AI, synthetic biology, or molecular nanotechnology, or nuclear weapons. In these areas, misaligned incentives and hacking can have catastrophic consequences. So this is my problem number three, that our systems of governance are not suited to our power level. They tend to be rights-based, not permissions-based. Right? They're designed to be reactive because traditionally there was so much damage a single person could do. So reactive was good enough. Now, we do have systems for regulating dangerous technologies. Think about automobiles. They're regulated in many ways, driver's licenses and traffic laws, automobile regulations and road design. Compare this to aircraft, much more onerous licensing requirement, rules about flights, regulations on aircraft design and testing, and a complex government agency that oversees it all day to day. Or pharmaceuticals, which have very complex rules surrounding everything around researching, developing, producing, dispensing. We have these regulations because this stuff can kill you. The general term for this kind of thing is a precautionary principle. Basically, when random new things can be deadly, we prohibit them unless they are specifically allowed. So my question is, what happens when a significant percentage of our jobs are as potentially damaging as airplane pilot, right? or even more damaging, when one person can affect everyone through synthetic biology, where a corporate decision can directly affect climate, or imagine something in AI or robotics. Even things like the precautionary principle have no are no longer sufficient, right? Because breaking the rules can have global catastrophic effects. And AI will supercharge hacking. This is one of my conclusions in my book, that we've created a series of non-interoperable systems that actually interact, and that AIs will be able to figure out how to take advantage of more of those interactions, finding new tax loopholes, finding new ways to evade financial regulations, creating what I call micro-legislation that surreptitiously benefits a particular person or group. And catastrophic risk means this is no longer tenable. All right, so these are our core problems. Misaligned incentives leading to too effective hacking of systems where the cost of getting it wrong to be, can be catastrophic. Or maybe just to put more words on it, misaligned incentives encourage local optimization, and that's not a good proxy for societal optimization. This encourages hacking which now creates greater harms than at any point in the past because the amount of damage that can result from local optimization is greater than any point in the past. That's my problem statement. So let's get back to the notion of democracy as an information system. It's actually not just democracy. Any form of government is an information system. It's a process that turns individual beliefs and preferences into group policy decisions and then uses feedback mechanisms to determine how well those decisions are working, and then makes corrections accordingly. And historically, there are many ways to do this. We can have a system where no one's preference matters except the monarchs, or the nobles, or the landowners. 
Sometimes a stronger army gets to the side or the people with the money. Or we could tally up everyone's preferences and do the thing that at least half the people want. Right? That's basically the promise of democracy today at its ideal. Parliamentary systems are better, but only in the margins. Right? And it all feels kind of primitive. Lots of people write about how informationally poor elections are at aggregating individual preferences. It also results in all the misal- all the misaligned incentives. So I guess I need to stop here and, and, and say that, yes, I realize that democracy serves different functions. And people write about these. Peaceful transition of power, minimizing harm, equality, fair decision making, better outcomes. I'm kind of taking it for granted that democracy is good for all of these things. And I'm focusing on implementation here. Modern democracy uses elections to determine who represents citizens in the decision-making process, right? And all sorts of other ways to collect information about what people think and want and how well policies are working. So these are like opinion polls, public comments to rulemaking, advocating, lobbying, protesting, all those things. Uh, And in reality, I think it's been hacked so badly that it does a terrible job at executing on the will of the people, which creates further incentives to hack those systems. Now, to be fair, the democratic republic was the best form of government that mid-18th century technology could invent, right? Because because communication and travel were hard, we needed to choose one of us to go all the way over there and pass laws in our name. And it was always a course represent, of course, approximation of what we wanted. And our principles, values, conceptions of fairness, our ideas about legitimacy and authority have evolved a lot since the mid 18th century. Right? Even the notion of optimal group, ap- optimal group outcomes depends on who is considered in the group and who is out of the group. But democracy is not a static system. It's actually an aspirational direction and one that really requires constant improvement. And our democratic systems have not evolved at the same pace that our technologies have. Right? And blocking progress in democracy is itself a hack of democracy. Today, we have much better technology that we can use in the service of democracy. Right? Surely there are better ways to turn individual preferences into group policies now that communication and travel are easy. Maybe we should assign representation by age or profession or randomly by birthday. Maybe we can invent an AI that calculates optimal policy outcomes based on everyone's preferences. Whatever we do, we need systems that better align individual and group preferences at all scales. Systems designed to be resistant to hacking and resilient to catastrophic risks. Systems that leverage cooperation more and conflict less, right? And that are not zero sum. Question, like, why can't we have a game where everybody wins? So this has never been done before. It is not capitalism. It is not communism. It is not socialism. It is not current democracies or autocracies. It would be unlike anything we've ever seen. Right, so some of this comes down to how trust and cooperation work. So in 2012, I wrote a book about trust called Liars and Outliers. And in it, I write about four systems for enabling trust, our innate morals, concern about a reputation, the laws we live under, and security technologies that constrain our behavior. And I wrote about how the first two are more informal than the last two. Now the last two scale better and allow for larger and more complex societies, right? They enable cooperation among strangers. What I didn't appreciate is how different the first and the last two are. Morals and reputation are both old biological systems of trust, person to person, based on human connection and cooperation. Laws, and especially secure technologies, are newer systems of trust that force us to cooperate. They're socio-technical systems. They're more about confidence and control than they are about trust, really. And that allows them to scale better. A taxi driver used to be one of the country's most dangerous professions. And Uber changed that through technology, through pervasive surveillance. My Uber driver and I don't know or trust each other, 
But the technology lets us be confident that neither of us will cheat or attack each other. In today's tech-mediated world, we are replacing the rituals and behavior of cooperation with security mechanisms that enforce cooperation, right? and innate trust in people with compelled trust in processes, technology, institutions. That scales better, but we lose the human con- connection. Right? And misinformation is more effective against large-scale, low-trust systems. These systems are also expensive and becoming even more so as our power grows. So we need more security for these systems, and the perverse result is that they become easier to have. But here's the thing. Our informal systems of trust are inherently unscalable. So maybe we have to rethink scale. Our 18th century systems of democracy were the only things that scaled with the technology of the time. Right? Imagine a group of friends deciding where to have dinner. One is kosher, one is a vegetarian. They would never use a winner-take-all ballot to decide where to eat. But that's a system that scales to large groups of strangers. And scale matters more broadly in governance as well. right? We have global systems of political and economic competition. And at the other end of the scale, the most common form of governance on the planet is socialism. right? It's how families work. People work according to their abilities and resources are distributed according to their needs. And my guess is that we need governance that is both very large and very small. Are our catastrophic technological risks on planetary scale? Climate change, AI, internet, biotech. And we have all the local problems inherent in human societies. We have very few problems anymore that are the size of France or Virginia, or Texas. And some systems of governance work well on a local level, but don't scale to larger groups. But now that we have more technology, I think we can make other systems of democracy scale. Now, this runs headlong into historical norms about sovereignty. That's already becoming increasingly irrelevant. The modern concept of a nation arose around the same time as a modern concept of democracy mid-18th century. But constituent boundaries are now law larger and more fluid, and they depend on context. Like, it makes no sense to that the decisions about the drug war or climate migration are delineated by nation. They're much larger than that. And that's why groups like the G20 and the EU, they, they, they these are getting more power, because they're larger. Right, right now, there's no governance body with the right footprint to regulate internet platforms like Facebook. And Facebook has more users worldwide than Christianity. (laughs) And we also, I think, need to rethink growth. Growth only equates to progress when the resources necessary to grow are cheap and abundant. Growth is extractive at the expense (laughs) of something else. And growth is how we fuel our zero-sum systems basically by taking things that don't count in the equation. So if the pie gets bigger, it's okay that we waste some of the pie in order for it to grow. And that doesn't make sense when resources are scarce and expensive. Growing the pie ends up costing more than the increase in pie size. And sustainability makes a lot more sense here. And it's a metric more suited to the environment we're in right now, right, with resources constrained. And finally, agility is also important, right? Back to systems theory, governance is an attempt to control complex systems with complicated systems. And this gets harder as the systems get larger and more complex and as catastrophic risk raises the cost of getting it wrong. So in recent decades, we have replaced the richness of human interaction with economic models, right? Models that turn everything into markets. And market fundamentalism scaled better, but the social course was enormous. And a lot of how we think and act isn't captured by those models. And again, those complex models found to be very hackable, increasingly so at larger scales. So lots of people have written about the speed of technology versus the speed of policy. Uh, To relate it to what I'm talking about, 
our human systems of governance need to be compatible with the technology they're supposed to govern. And if they're not, eventually the technological systems replace the governance systems. Right? Think of Twitter as the de facto arbiter of free speech, or at least before you know they've lost a lot of their prominence. And this means that governance needs to be agile and to be able to re- quickly react to changing circumstances. And this is the only way to regulate technology, right? Technology is moving at unprecedented speeds. We're getting it wrong could be catastrophic in a world that's resource constrained. So I want to quickly mention two ideas for democracy, uh, one old and one new. I'm not advocating for either. I'm just trying to open you up to new possibilities. The first is sortition. And so these are citizen assemblies that are brought together to study an issue and reach a policy decision. They were popular in ancient Greece and Renaissance Italy. They're increasingly being used today in Europe. Uh, the only vestige of this in the United States is the jury. But you can also think about trustees of an organization right, as, as a way to do sortition. People entrusted making decisions for the larger group. Second idea is called liquid democracy. This is a system where everybody has a proxy that they can transfer to someone else to vote on their behalf. And representatives hold those proxies and their vote strength is proportional to the number of proxies they have. And so we have something like this in corporate proxy governance. Both of these are algorithms for converting individual individual beliefs and preferences into policy decisions. Both of these are made easier to 21st century technologies. They're both democracies, but in new and different ways. And while they're not immune to hacking, we can design them from the beginning with security in mind. And both of them point to technology as a key component, really, of any solution. Right? We know how to use technology to build systems of trust, both the informal biological kind and the formal compliance kind. We know how to use technology to help align incentives to defend against hacking. Right? Think back to democracy it's an information system. Can AI techniques be used to uncover our political preferences and then turn them into policy outcomes and then get feedback and then iterate? Right? This would be more accurate than polling. It might even be more accurate than elections. Right? Can an AI act as a representative? Could it do a better job than a human at voting the preferences of its constituents? Or can we have an AI in our pocket that votes on our behalf thousands of times a day based on the preferences that it infers we have? Or maybe, maybe this is better, based on the preferences that it infers we would have if we read up on the issues and weren't swayed by misinformation. Right? It's just another algorithm for converting individual preferences into policy decisions. And it certainly solves the problem of people not paying attention to politics. But okay, we kind of have to slow down. This is rapidly devolving into technological solutionism. And we know that doesn't work. A general question to ask here is when do we allow algorithms to make decisions for us? And so sometimes it's easy. I am happy to let my thermostat automatically turn my heat on and off. I'm actually happy to let an AI drive a car or optimize the traffic lights in the city. I'm less sure about an AI that sets tax rates or corporate regulations or foreign policy, right? Or an AI that tells us that it can't explain why, but it strongly urges us to declare war right now, right? (laughs) Each of these are harder because they are more complex systems non-local, multi-agent, long duration. And I also want any AI that works on my behalf to be under my control and not controlled by a large corporate monopoly that just allows me to use it. And learn helplessness is an important consideration here. Like we're probably okay with no longer needing to know how to drive a car, but we don't want a system that results us in us forgetting how to run a democracy. Right. Outcomes matter here, but so do mechanisms. Any AI system should engage individuals in the process of democracy and not replace them. 
So while an AI that does the hard work of governance might generate policy, better policy outcomes, there is social value in human-centered political systems, even if they're less efficient. And a more technologically efficient preference collection system might not be better, even if it's more accurate. Right? Procedure and substance need to work together. I think there is a role for AI decision making, but it's along the lines of making sense of large amounts of public input or moderating discussions, right? Highlighting ag agreements and areas of disagreement, helping people reach consensus. Consensus. But it's an independent good that we humans remain engaged in and in charge of the process of governance, and that value is critical to making democracy function. Right? So, so I don't think democratic knowledge is something that's out there to be gathered. I think it's dynamic. I think our political preferences get produced through the social process of democracy. Uh, if you read the political science literature, it's called preference formation. Like we're not just passively aggregating preferences. We create them through learning, deliberation, negotiation, adaptation. Some of these processes are cooperative. And some of them are competitive. Right? Both are important and both are needed to fuel the information system that is democracy. So we are never going to remove conflict and competition from our political and economic systems. But human disagreement is not just a surface feature, it goes all the way down. Right? We have fundamentally different aspirations, we have different, want different ways of life. I've talked about optimal policies. Even that notion is contested. Optimal for who, with respect to what, with what, which values, over what time frame. Our disagreement is fundamental to democracy because we all reach different policy conclusions based on the same information. And the process of making all of this work is what makes democracy possible. Right? So we can't actually have a game where everybody wins. Our goal has to be to accommodate plurality, right, to harness conflict and disagreement, and not to eliminate it. While at the same time, moving from a player versus player game to a player versus environment game. All right, so there's a lot missing from this talk. Right, so what any of these new political dynamic systems might look like. I think dem democracy and capitalism intertwine in complex ways. I don't think we can reinvent one without reinventing the other. My comments about agility lead to questions about authority and how that interplays with everything else and how agility can be hacked. We haven't talked about tribalism in its many forms, right? In order for democracy to function, people need to care about the welfare of strangers who are not like them. We haven't talked about rights or responsibilities. What's off limits to democracy is a huge discussion. Or civics, right? Edging, educating people about their rights and responsibilities is critical. And, and Buterin's trilemma also matters here that you can't simultaneously build systems that are secure, distributed, and scalable. I also haven't given a moment's thought to how we get from here to there, right? Everything I've talked about incentives, hacking, power, complexity also applies to any transition systems. But I think we need to have unconstrained discussions about what we're aiming for, right? If for no other reason than to question our assumptions and to imagine the possibilities. And while a lot of the AI parts are still science fiction, they're not stupid science fiction. And, you know, I know we can't clear the board and build a new governance structure from scratch, but maybe through this process, we can come up with ideas that we can bring back to reality. All right, so let me summarize. The systems of governance that we designed at the start of the industrial age are not really suited to the information age. Their incentive structure is all wrong. They're insecure and they're wasteful. And they don't generate optimal outcomes. At the same time, we're facing catastrophic risks to, uh, to society due to powerful technologies and a vastly constrained resource environment. We need to rethink our systems of governance, more cooperation, less competition, at scales that are suited to today's problems and today's technologies, 
with security and precautions, with security and precautions both built in. What comes after democracy might very well be more democracy, but it's going to look very different. And I think this is a challenge worthy of security expertise. So that's my talk, and I'm happy to take questions, comments, criticisms, complaints, pretty much anything, because this is very much a work in progress. Well, thank you so much for that, Bruce. A uh, lot to chew on, and I'm sure you will definitely have some questions. Uh, I think I will ask you one first, just because uh, your talk made me think of it, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, the famed uh, German mathematician Kurt Gödel, upon immigrating to the United States in the 1940s, famously quipped to a friend that he had looked at the U.S. Constitution and had realized it basically had a back door in it that somebody could use to completely subvert it and overthrow our system of government. But he never told anybody what the back door he saw was. I've never heard that story. That's a fantastic story. You've never heard it. Your thoughts? I've never heard that story. That's a fantastic story. <laughs> I, and, I think, and I think we're learning the back doors. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in my book on the different back doors in the Constitution. And, and a lot of it is that much of it relied on agreements, not laws, but norms, which turn out to be you know, not enforceable. That's a fascinating story. I think about Godel. I, I thought you were going somewhere else because, you know. I could go many places with Godel. <laughs> I, I think there is an incompleteness theorem analog to uh to systems and hacking that you that you cannot just like he says you can't create a mathematical system that doesn't have a paradox in it or you can't create a closed complete mathematical system i think you can't create a closed complete system of rules in general that any systems of rules is necessarily incomplete or inconsistent which makes it vulnerable to hacking, that you cannot create a system that is invulnerable to hacking. That feels like a generalization of Godel's theorem. He thinks about mathematical systems. I'm thinking about systems in general. All right. And I really, it's not, I, I'm going to look up that. That's a great story. I'm going to look oh, it up. I, yeah. I, I mean, maybe the internet lied to me, but I think I heard it from a reputable source. So <laughs> I mean, if it's on the internet, it must be true, right? You know, yeah. Then we got a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, should I stand where you want? Uh, uh, just I'll repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's the most important thing about the worlds of cybersecurity and AI crossing over, in your opinion? Uh, so I, I heard the question. Either, can you can you hear that, Bruce, or will I need? Yeah, it? I heard it right. And okay. the most important thing about AI and cybersecurity. What, what do you mean by crossing over? We're having more and more impact on each other. Okay. So. Uh, and the answer is we don't know. I mean, I've thought about this in terms of the offense-defense balance. That does AI affect the benefit the attacker or the defender more? It's going to benefit both. And it's not going to benefit them equally, but I'm not sure how it shakes out. In the near term, I think AI benefits the defender more because the attacker is already attacking at machine speed, and AI will allow defense at machine speed. But that's a very general hand wavy thing. <laughs> uh, I think AI, I mean, AI is now being used to find vulnerabilities in source code. It's the kind of thing you'd imagine AI would be good at, right? A huge amount of data, pattern recognition. It's not very good at it yet. The papers are kind of mediocre, but it's going to get better. That will benefit both the attacker and the defender. But in the long term, that benefits the defender because any AI system that finds vulnerabilities, will eventually be built into the compilers. And you can imagine that it'll find all the vulnerabilities before the code is released. So you have a very dangerous uh, middle where the old stuff is very vulnerable, but the new stuff is secure. Eventually, the new stuff takes over. But that's a very long-term answer. Short-term, I don't think we have any idea. Got another question? I'm just kind of interested in like hearing more and not specifically about the constitution relying on norms, but I mean that I can expand like, even further than the founding document. Uh, hearing more than that in you know, I think the question is just more about like the 
expanding on the idea of our system of governance depending on implicit rules or norms as opposed to explicit rules. Yeah, so it's interesting. And, and we learned this during the Trump administration, like how much of our system of government depended on we do these things because that's the way we do them and not based on law. And if you disregard those, you can do a lot of things. Now, how we got there is interesting that that there's just so many that complex society needs so many rules that you can't write them all down. I mean, you know, the if you think about you all in the classroom, you're all sitting there facing me, nobody's jumping up and down, nobody's singing. These rules aren't written down. We we just all know the rules of, of being in a classroom. We've learned them since kindergarten. But they're all basically norms. No one's preventing you from doing these things. We just like know we shouldn't do them. And if someone stands up and starts singing, we're all going to look at you funny. Right? I mean, I mean, and that is true for all systems. There are just too many rules. They change too quickly. They're too context dependent. So they turn into norms that we understand. and. But we don't write them down because we really can't. And you know, I'm not sure we could get around that. You actually, I have an interesting thought follow up to that based on what you said, which is like, is the problem that the digital information world does not have the equivalent of what happens in meat space of you break a norm and you risk another one of us potentially getting physical with you to be blunt like is the problem that the internet you can't get punched in the face when you break the norms yeah i don't think it's physical but i think there is a uh, a reputation loss right i mean if i invite you over to my house and you steal my sweater i'm not going to call the police but i'm not going to invite you over again <laughs> right, right? So, i mean so so we have these informal systems of norms and punishment that don't involve laws that don't of because you know, it, it, it's too small. And on the internet, you don't have a lot of that reputational, uh, those reputational systems, they work differently. People other than me have written better about this, and, and I'm not sure I can do it justice. But I think that's part of what's going on. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first, just a thank you for such a nice follow-up. Um, I'm in political science by the so I'm going to be this from a totally different um, point. But you were talking earlier about moving on or evolving democracy and how that's intrinsically tied to capitalism and how we can use to change both of those. And you briefly mentioned the idea that modern nation states can't effectively regulate companies to Facebook. Or I would say, uh, <laughs> do you think this evolution of your sort of division may require abandoning the idea of a nation state? May require what? Say the last thing again. Abandoning the idea of a nation state. Do we need to get you know, rid of nation states? Yeah, I mean, I I, I, t I tend to think we need very large and very small governance. That all nation states do is like declare war on each other. I want to see governments. I mean, the valuable, the valuable governance systems are the very large ones, and the community sized ones. The, the ones in the middle are increasingly irrelevant. I mean, again, getting from here to there has probably never happened. But if I was starting over from scratch, that's what I would do. That I don't think there is value. I mean, the if you think about France or Virginia or you know or or the states got bigger as they went west, they really reflected the size of territory. You could reasonably govern based on the technology of the time. And now we can govern planetary sized things. We, we mean technology, right? Distance is not a barrier anymore. So we don't need this, this chunkification in, in US states, Canadian provinces, European countries. We could do the EU, we could do the world just as easily. So yeah, I mean, I, you, you, we need right sovereignty that that geographical boundary has laws, but Facebook is like a non-geographic sovereign, 
And the only analogy we have of one of those, the real good one, is the Catholic Church, which for a couple of thousand years was a non-geographic sovereignty. And Facebook resembles the Catholic Church more than it does a nation. <laughs> now, that's just super weird. But you know, how do we deal with non-geographic sovereigns in the modern world, like a Facebook? Or a Twitter. You know, what is what is it like? I mean, you know, these these companies are, you know, like de facto arbiters of free speech because they do all the work. You know, so what does it mean to live under their jurisdiction? And how does that collide with geographic jurisdictions? And what happens when we have overlapping jurisdictions? You know, with government, they're all concentric. Right, town, city, state, country, world. Right, they're embedded in each other. But Facebook goes across them in the same way the Catholic Church did. Now that Catholic Church analogy is brand new in my head, so I'm not even sure where to take that. But I think it's super interesting. Put <laughs> it mildly. Uh, got another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, how would you apply a Nash equilibrium and a dominant system for checks and balances to address neurosub games? Don't know. That's that's a question I ask, right? And, and and you know, for those who don't know economic theory, a Nash equilibrium is is a system which everybody is pursuing a strategy that is optimal for them, and 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 like there is no better outcome for anybody shifting their strategy. You know, where do we, how can we do that in these large systems? I think we need to think about that. And that that's part of the way to, to imagine the, any of these new systems. Yeah, I mean, thinking about both liquid democracy and uh, sortition as starting points are really very different ways of imagining a democracy. And I think they're good thought experiments of where this can take us. We kind of take us in ways where where that if I pursue my optimal strategy, it is the same as the group optimal strategy. Because right now we don't have that. I mean, I'm voting against your team. My product is pitted against your product. You know, it's inherently uh, uh, repetitive and wasteful. Because that's what worked. And there's no good Nash equilibrium in those systems. So I, I don't have an answer, but but you know, that's the right way to think about the question. More questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is more like a, a comment or just an inquiry. I mean, uh, have you if you move close to the front, I can hear you better. I'll repeat his question, Bruce. Don't worry. Yeah. All right. Uh, Systems of cooperating competitors like uh, the players in the semiconductor industry, where both you know Intel and AMD and uh, you know IBM and all these kind of people would get together with the equipment manufacturers in the Netherlands and Japan, and somehow they would work it out and make a roadmap and collaborate at that level, and then go back to the I, I think so the question is, have you thought about it? And the statement is maybe. Yeah, so I sort of heard that. I mean, wasn't there a no. book on this called Coopetition? The idea that you're cooperating and competing at the same time? I mean, isn't that what your colleague Corey calls adversarial interoperability? <laughs> yeah, right. That's something else. But the notion that you can cooperate on some things and compete on other things and it's okay. I don't know. I'm gonna, I got to, I got to. Think about it. I gotta look that up. So um, <laughs> I'll maybe we'll look downstairs. Oh well. The corollary to that, I think, is that there's probably a lot of uh, indicators in neuroscience that would make us think that that our brain is doing that. It is forming these coalitions moment to moment of uh, competing cooperators or potential cooperators. This doesn't look anything like the neural networks of the AI that we're familiar with, but uh... that's pretty interesting, actually. 
Yeah, that's worth thinking about. <laughs> more questions? I probably could ask for 10,000 if the audience runs out, but uh, yeah, more questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mama. So, uh, do you have um, more examples of how technology pushes the changes of government itself, like the label of governance? Uh, you mentioned like cooperation by like Facebook and Uber, but the uh, uh, government itself, do you think that um, it's still very much a business centric system, or is it improved for the uh, uh, technology as well? Yeah. I think maybe, yeah, to summarize that question, like, do you see current tech trends potentially fixing some of the, the flaws in our current systems of government and democracy? Or do you see technology like literally washing them away, much like it did during the Industrial Revolution and forming new modes of governance? Yeah, I think it's less technology right now and more uh, the economic powers. I mean... Facebook has no qualms about dropping democracy in its uh, pursuit of profits. And that's kind of scary. So I, I mean, technology gives us different affordances, but I, it's, it's, it's the monopoly companies that are, are determining how it's being used. And I think that is a bigger consideration right now. I mean, I mean, I'm trying to do it sort of in this project is to imagine what technology could do if we didn't have any any baggage, any historical baggage, any corporate baggage, any anything. Like we've all landed on Mars. We need to govern ourselves. How do we do it? So I'm hoping some ideas come from that. I, I don't really know a lot about how to get from here to there. I mean, like we can't even get out of a two-party system, like let alone do anything radical. So I, I'm not optimistic. Uh, historically, major changes in how we govern ourselves do not happen without revolution, like do not happen without bloodshed. And that's not a great solution because we're just much more efficient to killing each other than they were, you know, in the 1700s. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, sure. Uh, in some discussions that I've had with people around the, the topic that you raise about uh, the the much greater uh, capacity of an individual to cause mayhem and have negative impact, uh, it caused me to kind of reconsider uh, surveillance or my values around surveillance. And I wonder if you I I get it, and you know, and and it's an interesting thought experiment. I mean, what do you do? If everybody in, you know, so we used to be in a world where we'll be okay if like one of two people didn't push the red button on their desk, right? What do we do if we're in a world where everybody has a red button and we're only okay if like nobody pushes their red button? It's a very different world. So your question is a good one. In a world where if someone does the thing, we're just screwed. It's too late. We have to prevent everybody from doing the thing. And maybe the only way to do that is like watching everybody at all times and responding fast enough. It's a not a great conclusion, but it might be one. So I don't know. And, and I think about that a lot. That this notion of freedom from surveillance only works. If like there's only so much damage you can do, it's okay. We don't watch you. You kill a few people. That's it. Then we're going to stop you. Right? But if it's kill a few million people before we can stop you, that's a way different planet. It feels like if we have the means to put in preemptive surveillance on everybody's thoughts and actions up until the point that they could be pushing a button, that we might have the means to put in some other guardrails, right? And but the question is, can we, right? But if everything's software, can we do it? I mean, I, this is a Cory Doctorow's point, right? You you can't create a bioprinter that prints everything except these dangerous things, right? Just like you can, can't play create a media player that plays everything except this copyrighted material, right? It media players play everything. That's their job. 
So like maybe there's no answer here and we have to invest in technologies that respond and recover quickly. Now they don't exist yet. We don't have technology in biology that respond and recover quickly, but that might, you're right. That might be our only answer. And that at the point of which people do this damage, surveillance doesn't work because this is never going to be fast enough. It'll just tell us it's happening as it's happening. And by then it's too late. Yeah, these are really interesting thought experiments, I think, because we don't really know how to live in this world at all. I think, you know, my sort of thought, and I'd be curious to follow up on this train of questioning is like, you know, I, I, as somebody who's a big privacy activist, but also thinks about, you know, technology slowly giving everybody the power of being like, you know, a god, essentially, like I think how laughable the gun control debate's going to get if 3D printers keep advancing. But, um, but I wonder, like, are there solutions, though, that don't involve giving massive surveillance or control powers to small groups of unaccountable people? Because we have right, right, right. For example, yeah. that doesn't go very well either. Right. So maybe the system is some universal accountability. And, uh, you know, David Brin writes about this in, in, in Transparent Society, that it's a world where everybody watches everybody. And, and you know, in his view, and I think he's right about this, the problem is what you said. The problem is not surveillance. The problem is power. I mean, the problem is that the surveillers have a lot of power and those being surveilled don't have power. When you turn it the other way, we call it transparency. Right? We watch what everything government is doing. And that's important because they're powerful and we're not. So the uh, I think in all these discussions, the power dynamic is something that's not talked about enough and it's critically important. So those are all really good, I think, things to think about and ways to think about it. Uh, yeah. At the same time, the anarchist cookbook existed 20, 30 years ago, and not everybody went out and started making bombs. It was those right. things that could have been addressed in different ways uh, that may have been solved by surveillance and may not have. So yeah, 3D printers can print guns, but there are other stops along the way, regulations on who can buy whatever chemicals, things like that. Uh, so so here so here's the but this is the problem in a nutshell. Anarchist Cookbook is a great example. And you know, it taught you how to build a bomb, taught you how to make a grenade, taught you how to do all these things. But so you could do it. Yeah, you can kill some people. But think about like the nuclear weapon anarchist cookbook, <laughs> which teaches you how to blow up a city. And yeah, only a few people will do it. And that's too many. That's the problem. Yeah, the, the anarchists of 100 years ago, we can handle a couple hundred in society. Who cares? The anarchist of 100 years from now, we probably can't handle one because he's going to create a bioweapon that drops the species. Right? So when the Five Sigma guy can ruin it for everybody, then we can't even allow one to exist. Now, it might be that that's an impossible situation to live in, and I've just explained the Fermi paradox. <laughs> Right. Or there are other solutions that we need to figure out. But that's a great analogy. And the difference is the tech level of that cookbook. To that end, just how irresponsible, in your opinion, do you feel companies like OpenAI are being? Because I can speak from experience, jailbreaking these things is laughably easy. Yeah. I got to be able to make LSD without much difficulty. Yeah, I don't know. I, and and a lot of this is if if OpenAI doesn't do it, somebody else will. I mean, there's a lot of talk about making these models close. I think open source models are incredibly valuable. I think we need what I think we need is a public AI that is a counterpoint to corporate owned AI. And the problem is less the AI and more who owns it and what they're going to do with it. And this is Ted Chang's. I think really really really. Uh, insightful point that people's fears of AIs are largely fears of capitalism. Right? It's who has the AI and what they're doing about it. It's not the AI itself. Any more questions for Bruce? And it is fine if we are running out of questions. I'm going to have to run soon in any case. Yeah, yeah. That we know you're a busy man. <laughs> That's all right. I, this, I, this, I enjoy doing this. It's good. I mean, this talk's been evolving over the months, so I'm always interested in sort of how it goes each time because it changes each time as I think of new things. 
Uh, anybody, please email me any comments, ideas. I got, you know, a few things to look up based on uh, on notes here. That's always useful. So I appreciate sort of any and all uh, reactions to this. Anybody who would like to uh, chat with Bruce, I can give you his email. We can chat. Schneier at Schneier.com. Super easy to find. Yeah, he has a famous blog, and you all should read it if you're not. <laughs> it's I really. From his blog. <laughs> well, in that case, um, if we're out of questions, I say let's give Bruce a very big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>